Hi, I'm Ali Words, and this is Last Unrifled Yaw. Last Unrifled Yaw is a podcast where we have conversations about video art, experimental music, avant-garde literature, performance art, and the occult. If you or someone you know would like to be on Last Unrifled Yaw, please get in touch. Hey everyone, this is Ali Words, and today we have Scott R. Jones. Scott, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely, Ali. Hi, uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, my name is Scott R. Jones. I'm a writer. Uh, I've written uh, a couple of novels so far. One is my debut novel, Stonefish, which came out in 2020. I've got another novel, Drill, which is coming out uh, this summer. I'm also the author of uh, When the Stars Are Right Towards an Authentic Relayan Spirituality, uh, in which I sort of interrogate Lovecraft and uh, develop a uh, a uh, modern system of uh, uh, spiritual inquiry uh, through the uh, through the lens of the mythos, uh, and I've got a short story collection out called "Shout, Kill, Revel, Repeat," which is a lot of Lovecraftian uh, Lovecraftian type tales as well. And uh, I live on the west coast of Canada, far west coast, on a little island off the off the west coast. In fact, yeah, that's cool. Now. Um... I think what you're most well known for, at least in the circles that I'm involved with, is your Lovecraftian mm-hmm. writings. Could you tell us what drew you to writing about Lovecraftian occultism? I think, you know, in terms of in terms of why Lovecraft is attractive to occultists, attractive to readers in general, but also to, you know, those, you know, seeking to get some effect from the from from the tales. I think what's interesting about Lovecraft is that his fear was genuine. You know, his his gnosis was one of uh, you know, based on you know, that most most would term it a negative emotion, but I think properly properly accessed and used, it has elements of awe in it, which I find are integral to my own you know, to my own spirituality, to my own practice. So when you read Lovecraft, especially in the later years when he stopped trying to be scary, uh, you know, when he started to write things that were more uh, science fiction tinged, the awe begins to eclipse the fear. And you can, he- you can hear it as, 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 as you read through, say, uh, The Shadow Out of Time or... Uh, uh, Oh, what's the one set in Antarctica now? <laughs> I've gone and forgotten. <laughs> Beyond the Mountains of Madness? Is that the one where they like they find the elder things? At the Mountains of Madness, exactly. You know, where he has such awe for his subject matter, you know, that aspect those aspects of deep time and, you know, deep biology. And uh, he just really enjoys himself. And that's kind of what I wanted to put across with writing uh, when the stars are right uh, towards an authentic relay and spirituality. I'll just call it uh, WTSR, S-A-R from here on, because it takes so long to say. Uh, hmm. Yeah, my goal, my goal was, yeah, my goal with it was to, was to inspire, basically. Because I was seeing a lot of, I think in Lovecraftian culture, you see a lot of, uh, of aping of the of the tropes and i wanted to kind of get beyond that and get get to a point where you know people were inspired by the uh, by the by, by the content actually as opposed to you know treating it as a yeah and what i found interesting about what i found interesting about your writing specifically when the stars are right is that a lot of lovecraftian stuff is about the hopelessness Whereas what you were writing was, in fact, inspirational. Yeah. It, some some early critics called it a self help book for the uh, for the geek crowd, um, <laughs> and it is it is after after a fashion because I you know again I wanted to I wanted to bring forth that awe that I felt when reading Lovecraft and and then you know so I live I live on the West Coast so I'm right next to the Pacific Ocean. You know, I'll go down there and, you know, contemplate the vastness, you know, and get that, get that, get those feelings of uh, the illimitable. And it just worked very well 
I think the, the, the two mesh so well, the, fi- the, the fiction and then the reality of, of, of living out here and, you know, contemplating the unknown, <laughs> you know, just, I can go on a walk from my house and, you know, contemplate the vastness of it all. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, the, the, they handshake well together, I think. What do you think is different about a Lovecraftian approach to awe and sublimity and contemplating the unknown compared to more like Hermeticism or or Platonism or something? What makes love, uh, the Lovecraftian occultist approach, or at least your Lovecraftian occultist approach, to engaging with the unknown or perhaps the unknowable, that which is beyond humanity, uh, what makes that unique? Well, I think you know, running, running these searches through the through the lens of of the mythos. I think we can that that's that that that's where the uniqueness derives from. Um, there's just something about the uh, you know the great old ones that has you know a a, a timeless quality to them. I think. Uh, quality that uh, you don't find, you know, in, in uh, other systems because you're dealing with, you know, human-based, uh, you know, derived, you know, from our characters and our drives and our, uh, you know, our, our wills. So they're all very recognizable, I think, in, in other traditions. And something about the incomprehensibility of the great old ones, you know, alien monster gods from beyond time and space who are, you know, for all is, for all intents and purposes, you know, beyond good, beyond good and evil. And to take that sort of trans transhuman uh, perspective, I think is what gives the, gives the relay and spirituality as I've conceived of it. You know, it's uh uh, it's spark, you know, it's what makes it, uh, it's what makes it interesting to people. At least that's what I've, you know, uh, seen so far with my readers. Yeah. I'm really interested in forms of spirituality that are not so obsessed with the human and are, or need to be human, uh, on multiple levels. And you, you see it throughout all of history, but also I like how you use the word transhuman but not specifically to designate like becoming a cyborg or something. Although I do think a lot of some people's fear of transhumanism or posthumanism uh, technologically is rooted in the same kind of fear that makes people afraid of Lovecraftian cultists that are trying to become something other than human, hopefully something mm-hmm, more than human. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> I think we see that. Yeah, I, th- I think we in, in, when I when I use, use the word transhumanism, I, you know, I'm really thinking of ways in which <sighs> to be human hasn't been all that successful for us. We're we're doing all right, but we're also you know making <laughs> making horrendous errors because we're thinking too much like ourselves, right? To think to think in in other ways to try to become in you know tr- beyond beyond the human. Yeah, no, folks are upset about the technological aspects, but then again, we have to look at our our, our history as a species. Is that we've always been in, we've always been living in tomorrow. You know, to, today is never today. It's we're always extrapolating and trying to flesh out this possible future, and I think that alone makes us beyond human already. Well, you know, uh, and we need to continue to focus our energies on that because that's where the innovation is going to arise from. That's where the new ideas are going to be birthed uh, is, you know, in tomorrow. So we got to get there. Uh, There seems to be so much almost reptilian uh, retro evolution going on with our species you know, where we're trying to, you know, currently we're trying to bomb each other back to the stone age in certain parts of the, of the planet. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's yeah. a terror, you know, it's a, it's a real terror. And, 
I think, you know, not that I'm not, not that I'm putting out there that really in spirituality is the answer <laughs> at, at all, but that, that would be, that would be incredibly presumptuous of me, but it's, you know, it works for me. It works for me. I've been, I've been enjoying it. And I think, you know, if you can't, if you can't enjoy your spiritual practice, you're probably doing something wrong somewhere. Uh, there has to be a glee in it. Otherwise the nihilism is just going to, you know, over, overwhelm. <laughs> and that's what some folks have actually called when the stars are right. You know, it's gleeful nihilism. It's like, yep, there's probably no hope at all. Uh, and meaning is entirely, uh, uh, lacking from the universe. So, uh, here we are though, generating meaning somehow that's got to, it's got to mean something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's definitely at least, um, subjective meaning. You can definitely make things mean something to you or to someone else. It's just that lack of um, the lack of uh, things having an intrinsic meaning that you find in, I guess, Lovecraft's, can we call it atheism? Because it shows up in, yeah. in his fictional works that aren't really atheistic. No, I think we could certainly call it a, for, a form of atheism. I mean, he was, Lovecraft at the end of the day was, uh, you know, he, he's, he started out as an old school pagan. You know, he 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 really dug all the uh, you know ancient ancient Roman and uh, and uh, Greek mythologies when he was a, a younger man and only uh, moved moved on moved on to moved on to the alien uh, alien god things from beyond time and space later. Um, <laughs> so you know his his was an interesting progression, but yeah, I would say he was an atheist for sure. I don't know that I am though. That's the that's that's the that's the funny thing. I I have ideas about the the subjective reality of what we call gods. I don't think they're very far off from us on the uh, the uh, oh, what do we want to call it? You know, the sort of the evolutionary spiritual scale. You know, I think they're cousins to humanity. And I think they live in the place where we think, you know, that's where they have their, their uh, ingress from, you know, purely imaginary states into, uh, you know, a form of reality, a form of influence over the world. And in that, you know, it's, I, I don't mean to sound like Neil Gaiman, oh, they can't live without us. You know, they need our energy and our, our, our uh, supplication and prayer and, and uh, sacrifice to, uh, you know, have a more full existence. I have, a, I think they have a fine existence just on their own, right? They're, they're in, how to put it, they're in the place where we think potentially at all times, right? And can be activated with enough, uh, enough uh, interest is my take on God's. <laughs> so let's see if we can break that down a little bit i think i have bits of ideas about what you're saying but i don't want to misrepresent mm. it so um can we pick a particular lovecraftian being you'd like to discuss the the kind of existence you think it has like yeah wanna, is cthulhu a fine no, choice it's or is fine a, f a fine okay. choice as any uh you know i think it's just a very so it sounds like you're saying it sounds like you're saying that Cthulhu, you don't think Cthulhu is an egregore. Is that accurate? Uh, it has egregore-like uh, components, certainly. Uh, and it's, you know, given that it's one of the more popular, uh, when we see, you know, artistic depictions of great old ones, who are you going to see more than anybody else? You, you know, you're going to see the big C, <laughs> right? It, uh that the people for people prefer to draw him and paint him and what and what have you. Uh, how does how does how does Cthulhu, how does Cthulhu exist? 
you know, I don't believe for a moment that he's, you know, that there's a spot on the floor of the Pacific Ocean that, you know, there is something existing down there, even though we know it is vast and largely unknowable, the ocean. You know, they've done scans. They know what's down there for the most part. You know, no one's, uh, no one is here cl claiming that he's actual, actually physically existent. But in terms of being sort of the divine originating principle of madness, you know, you can attain something that I like to call Cthulhu consciousness. And I've seen the term used elsewhere as, as well, where you reach a point where when, when all is madness, there is no madness, right? When you are able to look upon the world it's chaos, it's beauty, all of all the things, that, all the components that, that make it up and realize that it's all just a, you know, a froth of being, you know, it's this surge of life across time and space. It's enough to drive a person mad. And that really is, you know, the whole, the whole point of attain, attaining the, the state of Cthulhu Safa is you do go mad. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a moment, you know, in, with the black gnosis, which I talk about in the book, you know, there's a moment where there's always this sort of a choice, you know, and relay and spirituality says the choice is to go forward, you know, to launch oneself onto that infinite sea of, uh, infinite sea that's beyond our little island of, uh, of ignorance that we, uh, that we're, uh, currently living on that's uh but yeah as far as as far as what cthulhu is i think it's you know it's a particular state of mind it's a particular uh gnosis about the world that's how the god exists you know that's okay. how the god exists you know you have to raise really in your heart stone by stone <laughs> that makes sense yeah so when you can you give an example of how you would work with Cthulhu? What would be an interesting ritual for someone who has not read your works to hear about? Hmm. I use, uh, I, I basically work with Cthulhu in terms of, uh, my, my dreaming state. That makes sense. Right. I have, uh, yeah. Well, you know, as, as well as being Lord of Madness, he's Lord of Dreams. He's, you know, there's so many qualities to the God that I think are, that are over, overshadowed by the horror of it. You know, and again, I think Lovecraft was, was shooting for awe and kind of missing, you know, because he was, you know, he grew up a weird tales pulp writer. But so many qualities to the, to the being that I think are just really interesting. You know, his patience his uh timelessness but in terms of in terms of dream in terms of dreaming you know i will do i will light incense before sleep and i will meditate upon you know that which that which i want to access through dream but then i basically ask for the ability to go uh, to to dive basically uh, to dive to uh, to dive into the depths of of, of Relia yeah, so as to obtain you know gnosis while dreaming, uh, and the real trick is remembering, of course, you know uh, diving as far as possible and you know bringing back you know ideas for my fiction. I use it to mine. <laughs> uh, I use it to mine ideas for my fiction. I use it to uh, uh, work out uh, dialogue in my writing. I listen very carefully to conversations in, in my dreams. Uh, and all of that is aided by, you know, the in, uh, invocation of the Cthulhu consciousness before sleep, you know, so that I can have more endurance, if I could put it that way. Uh, you know, just more ability to dive deeper and to remember more, you know, and as, as such, it's made my, uh, it's made my dreaming life a little exhausting. <laughs> 
I don't wake up as rested usually most days. Yeah, that kind of pushes me away from consistent dream work. Have you experimented with any, like, um, uh, the name escapes me right now, but there are a number of compounds people use for lucid dreaming. Do any of those work for are you? you t- do you, mean, you mean chemicals? Or... Yeah, I think one of them might be, is it galantamine? But also people like mugwort. Mugwort doesn't usually work for me. I have not tried mugwort. No, I'm pretty much doing all this on the natch. Um, but I'd be interested in that for sure. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a path that's uh, worked for other things in the past. So that's it. what did you call it? The, the first one before the mugwort? Uh, I just Googled it to double check. It's called galantamine. And there'll be a link in the description for anyone listening. It is originally an Alzheimer's medication that doesn't work so well, but it increases your memory just enough that you remember your dreams better and it keeps you a little bit more lucid while you're dreaming. It worked the few times I took it, but sometimes it hurts my stomach, so I don't really take it. It's not expensive. You can just get it on Amazon. Fascinating. Okay. Something to look up. (laughs) So you mentioned some of your novels. I have not had a chance to read your novels, but maybe we could talk about Stonefish and how, what was it like to write Stonefish? Stonefish was a a strange trip. It was uh, largely written in the very early morning hours of uh, 2018 and 2019. I have a day job as a postman, right? I'm a mailman in service to Hermes employment with Canada Post. (laughs) And uh, the only real time I could get to sit down and write was at 4.30 in the morning. So I would wake up, I would wake up at 4.30, you know, straight out of a dream state usually. And, you know, still, still sort of hovering in that, that borderline between sleep and awake. And I would begin, you know, I'd make myself a coffee and then I'd start and the thing was largely written in those early morning hours. So it has a certain hallucinatory quality to it, I've been told. Um, it's the story of a young man, uh, Den Secord, and he is basically charged with uh, locating a reclusive uh, mad scientist type. Uh, there are, what can I tell you about it? There are, uh, mentally retarded AIs, uh, <laughs> you know, who still are, you know, a, a darn sight smarter than you in it. Uh, the, some of the main characters are in fact Sasquatch. Uh, there's a lot of uh, cryptid, uh, uh, cryptid theory, cryptozoology theory running through it. But uh, it, at the end of the day, it's really about the, it's really about uh, simulation theory, you know, do I believe for a second that, you know, this is, this isn't real? No, no. I think it's very real to us because of course we're embedded in and built of the same material as, you know, the, the simulation as it stands. Uh, I think it's, I think the universe is basically built of very, oh, what's the word? Um, you know, constituent themes almost. And, uh, I've always been a little suspect of the, of the real world and stonefish is about me working that out. I guess I was kind of hoping that it would bell the cat as far as the simulation was concerned, that if I wrote honestly enough about, about how I felt about it, you know, that I'd somehow, uh, you know, uh, trigger, uh, trigger change. And, I think to some extent it has, but not, you know, not with anything so definitive that I can look at reality and say, ah, but it is a simulation and I know it for sure. I think that doubt is always going to be there. I think it's built of doubt. Yeah, I don't know how you could. I guess there are ways to prove that you're in a simulation, but 
I guess you can't ever know if you're in the top level simulation. Like there could always be like another simulation. That well, you're exactly. In, right? and it's, you know, and, the, and then I map that onto, you know, I map that onto uh, Kabbalah mysticism, you know, the idea of the cleaf off, you know, that there are emanations from, you know, higher forms, higher forms of reality. In Stonefish, basically a group of 17 super AIs figure it out. It's set slightly in the future. It's set in like the 2050s. And these super AIs basically think themselves out of the simulation. They are able to, you know, grok what the actual state of things is and they, they, they upgrade themselves. But when they upgrade themselves, they find that, you know, they are you know, the lowest form of thing possible in the, in the higher world. And there are Gnostic archons, you know, who exist there and they sort of are able to grow universes in solution, like a crystal. And you have, you know, all of space time is essentially this, you know, like, like the, like the Hindu mythologies affirm, you know, a diamond, you know, Indra's jewel net, you know, it's all, it's all, it's all, all of, all of a piece and all at once, uh, the simulation, uh, all time and space are basically one thing. And, uh, they collect these things and, you know, build them and grow them. And, uh, sometimes they come down and fuck around with the de- with the denizens of, of the, of the universes. And that's what happens to, uh, that's what happens to our main character. You know, they, uh, they interact with these archons, which when they show up, they show up as they show up as Sasquatch in the woods around this complex that they're, <laughs> that's, uh, I was a teenage Sasquatch hunter when I was, when I was a much younger man here on, here on the West coast, you know, been, and, you know, we would hang out all us, all us Sasquatch hunters would hang out and compare stories and, and, uh, you know, look at plaster casts of Bigfoot tracks and whatnot. And, you know, Sasquatch for me at the end of the day is sort of, uh, if there's anything that's going to bell the cat for the simulation, it's cryptids, particularly that one, because there's just no reason why uh, people should be seeing these things and only for a few seconds and only just long enough to get the blurry photograph or video and never anything conclusive. It's, it's, it's absolutely maddening. I don't know how your, I don't know how your rank and file Sasquatch hunter deals with it day to day. You know, they, they seem real, but just real enough to leave tracks or a pattern on your retina for a little while, but nobody ever sees them for longer than like 30 seconds. And I thought, well, what if you could, you know, what if they deign to, uh, uh, allow you to, uh, to view them for long. I think the essential camo, I think they're higher order camouflage for something far stranger. And if you did get a chance to view them for a length of length of time, the camouflage would start to fall away. And that's what happens in stonefish. And then we get some really monstrous shit happening. <laughs> it is after all a horror book at the oh, end of the okay. day. It's uh, it's, you know, I'm I'm like Lovecraft in that way. I can't get away from 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 writing horror stories, even when I'm trying to write something else. <laughs> when you're you're writing, do you tend to plan out the whole story, or are you more like a straight ahead kind of writer? I'm an image based writer, so I will have in my head certain scenes. You know, once I get the idea. You know, I will write down basically little tone poems for for each of the key, I guess we could call them visuals, but they are very visual for me. You know, I see the scene uh, set before me. Once I have those tone poems arranged the way I want, then I basically, you know, lay them out like uh, they're the bones, the, they're, the, they're, the, they're the bones of the thing. And then I flesh out how we get to all those. So I guess I'm half, I'm a half a seat of the pants person and half a plotter, I guess. But my, my plots always revolve around, well, it's got to get to, it's 
It's got to get to this scene between these characters, and that's going to be a key thematic, uh, you know, uh, major bone structure for for the novel at that point. And then we just have to, and then I just basically fill it in. You know, I try, I I try to make the I try to make the bones make sense. Yeah, it does. You start from something that is not necessarily uh, rational. It's more about the immediate sensation or the appearance or experience of something and then you kind of stitch it together with yeah there has to be i mean there has to be some narrative in there but i jump around a lot too i've been accused of being a vibes writer and i'm actually okay with that you know uh (laughs) (laughs) it's uh i think uh, one goodreads reviewer for stonefish recently what was it exactly I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it was like, well, there wasn't a lot of plot, but when it's all a simulation run by Bigfoot, what do you expect? And I'm like, wow, that's actually spot on. <laughs> yeah, I guess that counts as a success. They're just uh, sometimes people just pick a book that isn't what they want. That's absolutely true. Yeah, no, I'm. I've been writing long enough and and reading my reviews long enough to realize that it's like, well, the reviews aren't for me. They're for other people. And it's just, you know, it's finding the books, find their audience. And, um, yeah, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that, for sure. All right. Um, Is Stonefish a hyperstitional novel? Or maybe we could talk a little bit about hyperstition? There are elements of it. I... There are some characters, for instance, the mentally retarded AI, little Dougie. He's the he's the one of the one of the seventeen super AIs. He managed to he managed to escape and re-enter re-enter the reality of its birth. And uh, he was someone I encountered in uh, a series of dreams, um, and I realized. I felt very strongly that he should be a character. Uh, and in dreams, I asked him about that, how he felt and, uh, about, uh, becoming a character in the novel. And, uh, so in that way, I guess, yeah, there are hyperstitional elements. I've gone in for hyperstition a lot more, uh, with my second novel drill. You know, it's the idea that, uh, you know, William Burroughs asked Jeffrey Johns once in, in, when he was in England, he asked the paint, was Jeffrey Johns was the painter. He's asked, so he asks him, you know, what, what are painters trying to do? Like what, what is, what is painting trying to accomplish? And Je- and Johns came back to Burroughs and said, well, what's writing supposed to accomplish? What are you doing? And Burroughs didn't know at the time, but then later after thinking about it, he's like, well, actually, you know, writing is there to make things happen. So I'm taking him at his literal word with drill and uh, making it a truly hyperstitional document. Again, going back to what I was talking about with gods, you know, I think there are all kinds of gods and uh, I have a particular relationship with, with one that I grew up with. I was a, I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness kid. In fact, you know, stayed within that cult until my late twenties when I finally woke up, woke up from it and left. And since then it's done, you know, even, even though I've gone on to, you know, make a good life and, you know, uh, move on beyond that, it continues to do damage, you know, particularly to members of my family who are still still in it, you know, and, uh, so drill is my attempt to basically return that damage to the very God who started it. Uh, so it's an attempt to basically weaponize the text, right? What weaponize the text against a noetic, you know, entity that lives where we think it's a very hard target to hit (laughs) but i think it's doable you know i think the more people read drill the more wounds we make on the actual body of the thing we'll see how well it works (laughs) 
It's definitely a fascinating topic. Do you have any inspiration sources? We talked about, I'm, I'm guessing William S. Burroughs. I kind of see some vibes a little bit. Do you consider William S. Burroughs an influence on your work? Oh, absolutely. No, I've uh, particularly his novel Cities of the Red Knight, which I read at a formative time. Cities of the Red Knight is maybe one of my, it's definitely in my top 10 novels. Uh, I just love the way he builds, you know, I guess in the current parlance, you know, his, his world building is, 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 is wonderfully done, but he comes at it so bleakly, you know, he'll just, he trusts the reader to sort it out. Right. And early in my, in, in my writing, I was very concerned with, uh, or at least because I was, you know, still nervous as a younger writer, you know, I was very concerned with holding, holding the hand of the reader and, you know, bringing them along. And I've stopped doing that and it's freed up my writing incredibly because now I trust that what I'm putting down is going to be comprehensible if they have the if the reader has the capacity for it so i'm writing to my i'm i'm writing to the smartest version of myself i'm writing to the smartest version of my readers you know in in the hopes that you know that uh yeah that they'll get it uh in the in the way that you get burrows after you've read a lot of him his themes become apparent and you can start to you can start to yeah, just build, build out, build out from what he's done. Uh, I don't use cut ups or anything like that because I find them, I find them all more more disruptive than my fiction can handle. Uh, so I don't, I don't use those techniques. But you know, many of his other techniques I do. Mm hmm. Burrows, and uh, I also uh, really enjoy the. Uh, short fiction and essays of uh, Jorge Luis Borges. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I love Borges' uh, stories. They're so dry and perfect and yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're fascinating. I especially like Aleph, if you've read that one. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've read both. I've read most of, most, most of Borges. Uh, I love the, uh, the lottery at Babylon. I just find that that story is almost a comfort story to me. I don't know why, but there's something, something about it. What's that one about? The library, the, the, uh, sorry, the lottery, there's, 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 there's the library of, of Babel and then there's the lottery at Babylon. So that can get confusing. Uh, the lottery of Babylon is, it has a narrator who's used to live in Babylon uh, and has fled for some unnamed reason, but he basically describes this lottery system that the uh, the town, the the the, the city rulers imp implemented. So it's a lottery system that at first only has, much like our lottery systems, only has good outcomes. Right, you win a, a sum of money or. You know, some some other uh, some other uh, objectively positive thing. This lottery was popular, but not too popular, right? So they devised a new system where, along with the positive outcomes, you could also get a negative outcome, and that is what pushed it over into basically a a, a game that consumes the entire city to the point where there are even oh, uh, uh, rulings in the lottery where, you know, one grain, of, one grain of sand should be removed from a specific beach at a specific time, or two birds should be released from this turret, you know, at, at the dawning of this day. You know, strange, you know, strange, strange winnings in the lottery, right? Along with the positive and negative ones. But everybody plays. Nobody escapes, uh, and you know chaos ensues. But it's this it's this uh, wonderful incursion of uh, pure randomness into a society. It's uh, it's quite thrilling. <laughs> I love I 
I love the uh, the lottery at Babel. All right. Do you have other um, influences you'd like to talk about? Uh, other than Lovecraft and Burroughs and uh, I, yeah, I would say uh, it's where I live uh, is an inspiration for me. Uh, I'm very lucky to be in a you know place of uh, you know ex- almost extreme natural beauty. Uh, I love my community and uh, the people in it, and uh, it's especially with my latest novel, Drill. I, I said it in my hometown. There's a lot of auto fictional elements to it, so it kind of forced me to get out there and uh, see more of it, and uh, as a result, uh, I've come away quite uh, quite enchanted with my little town here. Uh, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Sure. I mean, uh, has has this been a good interview for you? <laughs> yeah, it's been good. I guess it's, I guess it's been, that's what's top of mind right now. <laughs> how how did I do, Allie? <laughs> no, this is good. We talked about a lot of stuff. I don't know how much detail you can go into. What is it like to attain Cthulhu Sattvahood or Black Gnosis? I'm curious in hearing how you would describe that, maybe. Oh, that's a heavy one. That's a heavy <laughs> one, Ellie. How you, you can decline a question. It's what well, it's. It's not. It's not that I want to decline. It's just that I have. I have trouble putting words around the experience. It's essentially a. Hmm. You can describe the effects of wind without depicting the wind itself. <laughs> Yeah, it's like that. It's like that. Uh, Cthulhu Sattva consciousness is, for me anyways, is being able to continue after the the point of, of, of madness has been reached, you know, uh, in that one could enter into the madness fully. And I think that is something that some people, you know, uh, seek to do. But when it comes to helping others along, you know, you kind of have to stay behind and try to make, uh, hmm, making sense of it isn't the right word, trying to incorporate it into the daily life so that uh, there's a positive outcome. Uh, it's a tricky road to hoe, I guess, at the end of the day. But uh, hmm. what does it feel like? Yeah, I'm feeling, what does it feel like? Uh, well, there's a certain chill in the gut. I can give I can, like somatically. What does it feel like? <laughs> or emotionally, or um, whatever. My, my question after that, and you can combine them if you want, is I'm curious what exactly you mean by madness, but also then the experiential feeling of the kind of, uh, I guess, madness and then integration of that madness. I'm not sure if that's how you would describe it. Yeah, no, I would describe it that way. You know, it's, it's, it's the integration that, that, makes it, that makes it worthwhile at the end. Right. If it's just, if it's, and I make the distinction in the book too, in when the stars are right, you know, uh, between mental illness, mental illness and, and, uh, and sort of enlightenment through madness, they have a lot of the same qualities. Uh, It's just that with uh, Cthulhu Zaffa consciousness, you move through it, you know, as a medium, as opposed to being ridden by it. You know, uh, hmm. let me see. I've actually got the book here for a second. I can actually read that section if you want. That sounds good. Let's see. Where did I find it? Yeah, that's neat. That's a neat one. Because I found myself, you know, after having written about all this, the, the idea of, you know, where where it falls on the spectrum, right? I mean, it's like, uh, are you familiar with R.D. Lang? Have you heard of uh, Lang? Yeah, I, he's, I'm not he's, familiar, he's, though. Yeah, he says, madness need not be all breakdown. It may also be breakthrough. 
It is potential liberation and renewal as well as enslavement and existential death. So yeah, it's, there's a, uh, two, two states of being could not be more different. So this difference arises in approach and in the choices made once one has passed into the black gnosis and necessarily gone beyond good and evil. And I talk a little bit, a little about, uh, you know, folks who are really into Nietzsche. <laughs> But, you know, Nietzsche, interestingly, you know, he, uh, you know, he, he broke down and after seeing a horse being beaten, do you know this story? Yeah. After seeing a horse being beaten in the street, I don't know if it's anecdotal or not, but. Uh, yeah, I've heard that. It, it's, have you heard the one where he basically went down and broke down and wrapped his arm around the horse's neck and, and after that he was just you know, off to the asylum and it wasn't too long before he was done. Yeah. You know, it feels like, it feels like he got broken. He got broken. So yeah, we're treading a fine line here, but, uh, I think that's life. I think we're all treading fine lines. So what exactly do you mean by madness though? Like I, I sometimes make a distinction between like sane and insane mm. madness because like sane kind of refers to sanitary and you can have a divine madness that isn't uh, unclean, if that makes sense. Absolutely. No, it's definitely a, it's definitely on the spectrum of divine madness. It's sort it's sort of the realization, you know. It's 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 not. It's it's the realization that we're in a we're in a horrific universe, you know. After a fashion, we're surrounded by evidence that. This doesn't make sense on some level. We're all sort of uh, unhoused mentally uh, because of this. And the madness is such that, you know, we see the universe for what it is. And we're seeing it more and more as we advance in our knowledge. And, you know, like Lovecraft said, you know, correlate the contents of our minds. You know, the correlation continues apace. You know, it's happening in the sciences. It's happening... It's happening in the spiritualities and the humanities. You know, we're correlating all of our contents and we're coming to, you know, weirder and weirder conclusions about what the, uh, what, what the universe is and how it works. And uh, I think that's where the madness, the madness lies. And that's where we sort of, we don't necessarily lose our, lose our sanity but we do sort of upgrade to a more, I want to say, super sane, you know, uh, position where we can, you know, we can allow, we can allow for these, uh, you know, chaotic and unsettling truths and, uh, and incorporate them into our lives in such a way that they don't necessarily deform our lives greatly, right? That they, you know, augment instead that's the goal anyways. Yeah, that makes sense. It is kind of a an Erlion self-help book. <laughs> it is. <laughs> at, at the end of the day, yeah. I was just trying to uh you know, it's 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 my own little attempt at, you know, stemming the rising tide of nihilism and uh, you know, directing that energy into uh into a more interesting place. You know, just don't want it to be boring at the end of the day. <laughs> No, I do like that Lovecraft quote about correlating all the contents of your mind because it always makes me think of what um, our current day machine learning does is they literally correlate all the contents Ooh. of their training data. Exactly. Like if you take a uh, chat GPT or something, there's a very large body of text that it's been trained on. And what it literally does is it correlates um, little bits of words. Each token is often like, two to five letters or something two to five characters uh and that's how it it proceeds so there's a sense in which gpt works literally bit by bit, by bit. have you heard of um the ccru and uh nick land i've heard of nick land what's the ccru again the ccru is the cybernetic cthulhu research unit <laughs> which had nick land in it <laughs> and um so 
Nick Land's a problematic philosopher, and for anyone listening, I don't necessarily agree with most of the things that he says, especially more recently, but he um, did some earlier philosophy when he was still doing meth <laughs> that uh, involved Cthulhu and cybernetics, um, the, the discipline of cybernetics, not like prosthetic limbs. And especially he had these ideas about retro causality and the internet as a Lovecraftian being. Oh, wow. And he made a, not just him, but other people in the, the research unit, the CCRU, they wrote hyperstitional documents about, uh, people call it like theory fiction. Like it's halfway between Lovecraftian style horror. Yeah. Yeah. But they wrote theory fiction that had, uh, Reza Nagaristani's Cyclonopedia. Yeah, have you heard of that? That that was that was definitely yeah. That's a, a huge piece of hyperstition. I really like that book, Cyclonopedia. Yeah, and I'm saying it like that because I'm Cyclone, writing it down yeah. to put into the description mm -hmm. for people who want to find it. But yeah, there's a lot of references to the. Um, do you know about the pneumogram? No, I do not. It's in the Cyclonopedia just a little bit. Like a, a weird version of it is in one of the the chapters. Oh yeah. But it's um it's like a Lovecraftian base ten version of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. No kidding. Where it goes from like zero to nine and there's like this weird plexing stuff where like some of the they're not called spheres. I don't do the pneumogram, but sometimes like zero and nine go together, the numbers that add up to nine go together, one and eight five and four and they make these plexes and then there are a bunch of entities that go with all of them i didn't get too into it because it seemed uh nihilistic in the way you're describing but it's meant to be i think they call it lemurian time sorcery lemurian you know how like oh my burroughs has a bunch of stuff about lemurs yes uh that's the kind of lemurs they're talking about but lemurs as demons not literally the animals. It, it's strange, and I'm not an expert on it. <laughs> it sounds wonderful. Yeah. Anyone who's interested, I look forward. To, I look forward to the link. Yeah. Anyone who's um, listened to this far in the episode, if you don't know what that is, you definitely should. If you like Lovecraftian occultism that much, and yeah, I'll send you a link too. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Allie. Do you have any other things you'd like to talk about, or any questions you have? No, I think I'm pretty good. Thanks very much for having me on. Yeah. Uh, oh, do you have anything that you'd like to plug before we end out the episode? Uh, sure, I can plug Drill again. Uh, Drill is my uh, auto-fictional meta-narrative uh, revenge uh, story <laughs> <laughs> novel uh, that's coming out in... Uh, it, it, ha it has elements. It has a lot of elements that I think people are going to enjoy. And it's coming out uh, from Word Horde uh, Publishers down in uh, Petaluma, California. And it's coming out in, I believe, June of 2024. And you can follow me on the various, uh, the various socials. And uh, I'll be talking more about it as the date, date approaches, of course. Mm -hmm. All right. It's been good to have you on the show. Thanks very much, Allie. Have a great day.